All right, welcome to uh, Shop Talks, which is a production of the Ink Kitchen. There's free information at inkkitchen.com, and most of it is very accurate. And uh, we have a YouTube channel, Ink Kitchen YouTube channel. This uh, talk and all the talks we've been doing the last three or four years are up there free because of sponsors that we have, which include Los Angeles Apparel and Alpha Broder, Hirsch, John, uh, Fairweather Johnson, Resupply and Stalls. So support them, they make it all free. Um, I'm here with my uh, colleague, Stan Banks from T-Shirt Side Hustle and uh, in Kitchen uh, Supporter. And uh, we're gonna interview Justin Moore who is here from Barrel Maker Printing in the Chicago area and liveprinting.com. That's correct. All right, so uh, we're gonna talk about live printing today and uh, it's something that uh, I put for fun and profit because uh, there's a thing called irony and uh, sure. I was using it. It's, it's not that fun, it's tough, and it's not for the faint of heart and that's why I wanted to do this talk. So uh, let's talk about how you got into it and uh, it must have been a while ago if you own the URL. Yeah, we. Um I think the first live printing event we did was 2011 for Discover Card, and they, you know, they reached out to Barrel Maker to do an event, and um, it was, you know, just one of those things where we were like checking it out. It seemed really fun. We did it. It went. It went okay. You know, it wasn't like amazing, but we ended up. Um, kind of the takeaway was like this is like kind of a cool thing. There, there's it's screen printing in general is like a very saturated industry and in Chicago I think there's like I mean there's dozens of print shops all over and on the live printing side there's just far less of that so it seemed like something that was kind of cool but we didn't really have any good way to like market it or find new customers and the next year we ended up doing another event um, again, it was like another, it was a customer who came to Barrel Maker just kind of like being like, hey, could you do this like at, that was at a, um, a health club. And they're just like, could you guys do this in public? And we're like, yeah, yeah, sure. And you, you know, you drag like everything from your shop and it's pretty terrible. But um, I remember at that specific event, we had just a really, really big crowd, like big line of people. And there's more of that like kind of light bulb, like this, this would be cool if this is something we could offer. So I tried getting the liveprinting.com domain just because like um, I sort of default to like marketing online and focusing on SEO and building our website so that people could order, you know, a little bit more through our website because I don't want to, you know, talk to people. So <laughs> that's kind of the goal. And um, it took about a year and a half to get the domain because initially when I reached out, um, the, the company that had it was like, they wanted like something ridiculous, like $300,000. I think I countered them with like $1,000. So there's a little bit of a difference. But- And you compromised for a thousand and I five? Did I did it for a while actually. And then one night they reached out to me and they, they basically said, if, if you'll buy it right now, they, they came very close to my price, and I bought it. And what, were um, they drinking heavily, or what? I, what happened? I think they just, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. So they, uh, yeah, I ended up, you know, getting the domain, and the focus right off the bat was like, okay, like let's market live printing as the service, right? Um, so it took a long time. Ooh. It it took us several years. It would be. Well, can um, we talk about it as yeah, yeah. Like, uh, like the service part? Like the first ones, I mean, I remember people asking me to do it and like, uh, like, cause you could sell the shirts that you printed there. Yeah. Did you do that at the beginning? That's, you didn't make that mistake at the start? We've made the mistake. It's just, that's not our, that's not our model, right? So we've gone, we've had a few big events. Like let's say it's something like at a stadium and they'll give us the opportunity to sell them and we know that there's gonna be like 40,000 people there, we could do the math and be like, okay, cool. If we could sell even like 500 shirts at $30 a shirt or whatever, we're, like, we're looking good. But we definitely have had, um, we had a few where you know people would come to us and give us opportunity to sell there. You don't ever sell like what your expectation is, um, or at least we didn't. 
So we definitely turned away from that model. I mean, our whole, our whole entire model is basically like we're paid prior to the event for the amount of pieces that we're going to be distributing and the amount of time that we're there. Are those, are those priced at what you would normally price them at, or how do you build the pricing out for that if, you, if that's something that you're doing? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the pricing is a little bit like trial and error for a while. You know, like it's one of those things where like you, you throw you throw a price at somebody too many and you get too many no's. You're like, okay, well, we're a little high. So we kind of had to work backwards and find a little bit of like what's that happy medium where people will pay us, you know, to, to be at this event. And then how do we pull off doing the event to be profitable, right? And so... Um, kind of like in numbers, we've been able to like over time as we do more and more events, we're able to say like, well, if we could, if we could customize our equipment to be small enough to ship at this price, it's cheaper. If we could keep our equipment in storage units here and have like, you know, a shop or a courier, whoever bring it here, we start saving money. And, and over time, we've basically backed into taking the pricing that we could sell events at and making it more and more profitable. Do you think that, um, like what percentage of people understand that you are uh, like really providing an activity, if you will, and making their event more interesting versus yeah. you're making shirts for them and it happens to be live? Yeah. I've, you know what I mean? Because I know I've yeah, had a lot of people ask us to do it where I think they think that, I don't know what they think, but they, they, they want you to print them there, but they really just want to buy shirts. Like they don't right. get it. We 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 get a fair amount of business of people who come in and end up being realizing that live printing or live embroidery or whatever the activation is isn't actually the right fit, but we'll sell them on a couple hundred shirts for their event. So we do we do convert orders from people who come to us for that, but overall I would say like most people who find us, they know they already kind of know what it is and what they're looking for, and they, they want that on-site experience. You know, and there's, there's other things that come along with doing um, live decoration because we don't have any waste either. So that's a big part of it. That's, that's actually a really big part of our selling point. So, so for somebody getting started, what are some things they should consider or that, that might get overlooked when it comes to live print. I'm looking to start to like kind of set myself apart in my local m market yeah. with like the brewery scene. Uh, uh, we got a lot of breweries and I figure if I could go live print there, it will not only get the business out, but it will also gain me some business from being in that area. Sure, so I think a big differ di differentiator between, you know, the, the way that we do that and like a, a kind of like a local print shop doing it is our sole focus if we're printing for a brewery at a, at a street festival or something, it's like we're there representing the brewery only. We're trying to push their brand and their merch and they're on the spotlight, not us. And as a print shop, if you're going to live print, you know, for local community, your goal is to really be like, hey, we're a print shop, we print t-shirts and you're giving information about yourself. The thing is we're selling we're not trying to sell custom printing. If we're out and about in the world, we're selling live printing as that is our service. So I think that's like kind of one, but one do difference. Do you get asked to, uh, I mean, people see you're doing a good job. Do they then yeah. hire you to print shirts? Yeah, but not not as much as you would think. I mean, it's a pretty small yeah, that's why percentage. I, asked, I wondered if it was. And, and that's kind of why we've really focused on like selling the, the on-site activation as our service. As far um, as setting up for a shop, I know you've, at this point, you like you said, you converted some things and, and packaged them down, but what did you start with versus where you are now as far as setting up? Sure, I mean, we've, we've brought, um, we, most of our presses are Riley Hopkins. Um, so we've brought actually like full size Riley Hopkins before where you like take it apart and bring it on a U-Haul and it's, you know, it's really difficult. Um, typically for, for screen printing, we'll bring like tabletop presses. So I, r right now there's the Riley 150s. Um, we use Riley 150s, we just cut them down. <clears throat> we changed everything to be toolless so that when we um, get on site, we don't have to 
you know, use like screws and wrenches and everything, but we could just like torque it on site. So we've just made kind of adjustments that way. We've made road cases that could also serve as the stand, you know, just kind of little conveniences. But when you're first starting out, if you're going local, you could use pretty much anything that you have in your print shop already, as long as it's like a standard 110 outlet or, you know, something that you could lug around. It's just going to be harder. So how do you do you the know. curing then? What's that? How do you cure the ink? Carry in? Curry. Curing. Oh, how do we cure the ink? Cure the ink. We don't. It's one time use. Just washes off. <laughs> we they can use the shirts <laughs> again. That's great. Right. No, we cure with um, flash dryers and catalysts. We put catalysts in our ink um, uh, to give it a little extra bondage. I think that trick right there is worth the whole talk. There you go. Just catalyze all of your inks. But don't forget that if you're doing a multi-day event, <laughs> that's right, the end of it. Don't catalyze all your ink because you'll be printing a cement the next day. <laughs> yeah. There's the second good tip. Also, remember to bring, cement. remember to bring ink, too. That's important. So we, after you set up, uh, are you or do you do events where you let people have the actual experience of pulling a squeezy, or is it more that, or totally. how does it go? Yeah, we do. We've actually done a pretty good amount of DIY where we let the guests do their printing. Typically, how we set it up is we'll bring three presses. Two of them are usually not DIY, and one is because it's like it makes it very slow. Um, but do you people charge more. It. You know, like you go to the auto mechanic and says. You know, charge $100 an hour, 150 if you watch, we, 200 if you help. We like, is it like that? I mean, kind of. We charge more for, the, for, for each additional equipment we bring. Our hourly goes up. So, like, if, yeah, if we add a third press for a DIY, it's going to cost more. And when people get ink on themselves, what happens? We have baby wipes, uh, disclaimers, you know. No, I mean, people are generally, you could do it in a way that's fairly clean. You know, I mean, it's... As long as you can, people aren't, but you can also get yeah. a lot of ink on yourself. I, I think when you're in a public setting, especially live events, typically are in either like a lot of them are in like pretty high end, you know, hotels or restaurants or bars or state. There's a lot of, you know, you're when you're there, you you're aware that you can't get ink all over. I, I would say most people are like a little bit extra mindful. But yeah, common mistakes that you find over the years, common things that happen consistently, mistake-wise? Yeah, I mean, because we travel so much, right? We, not only do we travel, but we source stuff and we store things. So we're, we, have a, we have a spreadsheet, basically, of like what equipment we have all over. And um, really, the, all the mistakes come down to just like not actually checking off a checklist, right? We've made mistakes. We've done screen printing events where we forget to bring squeegees and print with like cardboard, you know? And it's like you get like five prints and then you have to like use another piece of cardboard. Um, Ouch. Yeah, it's not <laughs> ideal, you know? And so, so it's definitely one of those things where if you do like, if you're able to make a, a real comprehensive checklist of everything that you're going to need. And then really, really make sure that you have all of those things and double check. It's going to help you so much more than, you know, the worst thing is being in, in a crowd of 200 people trying to set up to print shirts and realizing, like, you forgot a screen or you forgot ink or a squeegee or any of these, these things that we need to print. But we also try and protect ourselves a little bit. Like, we'll send toolkits and things that like if we have to get scrappy and make a platen or jimmy rig something you know i try and go to events like this so that if i need to call someone and beg for help you know locally be like oh shit we forgot our ink or we forgot this you know i i, I know a lot of shops now that i can reach out to and call in some favors we, we had one here actually a couple months ago where we brought three heat presses to an event and one of them was supposed to be a hat press, and it was at the Dallas Cowboys Stadium. And we were able to find a shop about 30 minutes away, and they grabbed the hat press, and they drove it over to the stadium and saved our asses. So that was good. Was good. Uh, so do you do uh, transfers at all at these events? Yes. We do a How lot of... Go? Yeah, we do, a, we do a lot of heat transfer events. Josh Ellsworth um, here. I got I to gotta, I gotta pass that. What's that? Stalls? Yeah. Stalls. Okay. Yeah, they make transfers. We do. Um, thank you. 
So, yeah, we do a good amount of, of transfers. We, so, so for us, we do heat pressing on site, laser engraving, screen printing. We have hand jet guns. Um, we've done things like rhinestones, vinyl, um, hot stamping, patches, all kinds of... you encourage all that stuff or are people asking you to do it? I encourage it because I think it's it's fun to get creative. I, I love we work with a lot of um, marketing agencies, and they it could be annoying, but usually those people who are like kind of really pushing all the boundaries, those events end up having the coolest swag. Like you know, and and we've definitely seen stuff where we're like okay that turned out really cool, but yeah, heat transfers we've been doing a lot more of lately just because you could do you know, really colorful, crazy, photorealistic type quality, but also you could heat transfer onto a lot of items that are a little bit harder to, to screen print on. What advice would you give someone? So obviously you're full-blown live event printing, but if it's like more for people who have shops to want to use it or want to add this onto what they do, what advice would you give them for getting started? Yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty stressful, right? So, I think it's it's something that, in all honesty, I don't think a local shop is gonna make a ton of money live printing if you're just doing a handful of them each year, right? So you start to look at it maybe as a bigger picture thing, like like our printers, they enjoy I think just being able to go out somewhere. A lot of times it could be somewhere really cool with like live music or, or a brewery or like a fun atmosphere. And so it's it's more than just the, the profit at that point. It becomes a little bit about the culture and being able to share a skill set that you have, you know, with with a lot of other people and, and it's really gratifying, you know, if if you go and you work like a street fair and you're able to screen print and kind of show off your skill set, like you definitely feel accomplishment when it's done and so I think that's like a big motivation um, for us I I've done I've done events before where I'll show up a little too late and then I'm trying to set up and we have a line of people and you know all of a sudden it's like well I got to print 200 shirts in the next 40 minutes and, I, and it's like it's kind of like Olympic high stress screen printing. Ev everything's going wrong at that point yeah yeah <laughs> So it's it's sort of like it's like a better version of drugs maybe or worse or you could do both. So I guess you touched on yeah. something. You got to have um, people that want to do it, right? I mean, for I, sure. I, it's I, I mean, a friend of mine does it uh, in Boston, and he has you know one guy that really loves doing it. Mm -hmm. He has other people work for him. They don't like doing it at all. And so you know, he, if that person isn't available, he can't do it. Yeah, I mean, honestly, the biggest advice I would give is, like, if you're somewhere that has a specific time, like, let's say it's it's an event that's going to start at 6, everything's going to take so much longer than you think, you know? So, like, don't get there at 5.30 and plan to just, like, get everything set up, bust out your test print, be ready to go. Like, assume that you're going to get there and the electric isn't where you expect it to be, that, like, you're maybe going to leave something in the car, you know, that, like... There's just all these, there's going to be complications. So the best thing you could do is just give yourself like so much more time. I would much rather like set up and then have a, a down hour or two hours before we start to go grab coffee or lunch or something like that. But um, how do you transport your rig? Like what's that? how do you transport your uh, equipment? Yeah. So we have a few methods. We have, um, we do basic shipping, right? Like we'll do. FedEx for a lot of our stuff. We have, um, we basically have kits broken down for screen printing presses, heat presses, embroidery. Everything is is broken down to fit in essentially a size that gets us a good shipping rate. Um, it's very padded. We do currently have, I think, three embroidery machines in a repair shop. We have eight road cases right now being repaired, so sh things get messed up for sure. Um, but then we also have a couple other methods. We have equipment in high traffic areas. So maybe cities that we work a lot in, we have equipment there and we'll fly out, we'll go to a storage unit 
and we'll basically just, you know, either Uber or rent a car and then drive it there. And then kind of our third method is we work with a ton of local print shops, right? And we've actually found a lot of print shops where they like working with us because they're like, their printers like live printing, but they don't necessarily want to deal with like booking the event. Yeah, all the, the logistics. So we're, we're, it's kind of a win-win for us because we're able to say like, oh, we have this event in New York City and we have this really cool shop in New York City that likes live printing. So we'll work with them will basically gather all the information that's needed, hand all of the payments and everything, we'll ensure the event, make sure that it's gonna go well, and then we'll work with a shop that's local. And that's actually like, kind of from the beginning, my goal was to work with more and more screen print shops that are able to, to do the events close to where they are, because then it becomes easier and easier. The, the transportation's a lot cleaner, it's a lot less, you know, driving and logistics work out, but it's also just from a, it kind of feels like now you're supporting everything to be local, which I like too, so. Got a little more backup there too, if you forgot some ink, at least the For shop might be nearby, right? A hundred percent, yeah. So uh, actually you could print posters live, huh? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. So we're printing posters live over there. That's the, something else you can do. Uh, and Brian, the printer, will talk to you about it when he's over there. He's not there right now. You can also buy one of these if you want and give it to a great charity here in Fort Worth that's doing amazing work with homeless folks. Amazing work. That's so awesome. um, anyway, posters are over there. See them printed if you wanted and uh, get one. Um, should we do the questions or you got, Stan, you got more? Yeah. All right. Who's, uh, right. who's got a question? Any questions? Got a mic here. How do you go about uh, taking the order? Um, any technology involved or just paper? And then yeah. also like delivering it to the customer, getting it to the right customer. Any tips there? Yeah, so we have, um, we do have a developer, right? So we have our own app. So if we're on site, we have the ability to basically build out an ordering system where people could choose their design, choose their size, customize it. On the printer side, there's like a production side of it where the printer basically will see a mock-up. So when the customer orders, they see the mock-up, they print the order, they basically mark it as complete, and then the customer could receive a text message saying it's done, you could pick it up here, or, or you know, however that works. And actually we do a, a, a lot of integrations with our app where we'll maybe do like a follow-up coupon code or discount code. So, so if we're, let's say, doing an event for a brewery and they want to offer anyone who gets a shirt that night, um, maybe a 24-hour discount code to their online store, we utilize the app for that as well. So that is one method. Um, we probably use it about... 5% of the events. We've, we've built it because there are certain events where we do need um, an ordering system and there's stuff we've done, for example, like a golf outing where maybe they'll go to a registration booth and they'll design a golf towel and then when they get to like a certain hole, we're there with the towel already done. Um, so there's like some, some, there's a place for it. But I personally really like having just the, the human interaction part. And honestly, most of our activations are like very quick, right? We could screen print and cure a shirt or heat press a shirt in, you know, 20, 30 seconds. So it's not a long wait time. And it's, it's much easier to just talk to the, the customer or the guest, you know, and ask them, what they're looking for, cure it, give it to them while it's like nice and warm and see their reaction and, and go about it that way. How does customization affect like the workflow if you let them do some custom stuff? Yeah. Does it bottleneck you or? Yeah, it's slower. So there's a lot of intake information, right? Like we have a couple things that we have to figure out before we book an event. If someone's going to do customization, it's like what decoration method can we use to customize? Like that's like maybe embroidery or laser engraving it's or, or uh, transfers you know um, 
we've done a lot of jerseys where people like pick a, a name and number and then a design for the front, like that kind of stuff. But with like screen printing, for example, it, there's not a lot of customization. That's sort of like real quick. But yeah, the more customization you allow, the slower it's going to be. And so what we have to determine is like, is it okay for it to be slow? Do we need to have more staff and more machines so that it can be quick? But then do they have the budget to support that, right? And so typically what we're doing is we're starting with their budget and their target goals and saying, here's what we could do with that. You know, and sometimes it's awesome. Sometimes they come in and the budget's like not an issue and we could go all out. And sometimes you're like, cool, I know you want all these things, but we're just gonna like screen print bandanas. So koozies. Is there a ratio of like, uh, on, a, on the simplest thing where you're just printing one choice and people line up uh, to get shirts, like yeah. how many per hour can you, you expect for yeah. some, somebody that like has an event? I think with screen printing, if you're doing you know a one color print and it's like one design, you could easily be doing like sixty an hour, one a minute. I mean, keep it because we cure the the prints typically in about twenty seconds. And that said, too, we also limit our offerings to be easy, right? So like. That's a, when we were first starting out, obviously it's like you take any order you can and people are like, oh, I want this crazy thing. And you're just like, yeah, sure, we'll do it. And then over time you're like, wait, if we just do one color prints, it's like super fast. We could cure them a lot quicker. Um, we kind of like we're controlling the speed and the quality. So we've, we've definitely become more and more rigid so that we know our, um, our timings. Justin? Yeah, this one. Uh, you had said you you explore their budget from the beginning. Yeah. Let's pretend like there's not a budget, and it's just a beer festival that wants to hire you to print their shirts on site. Maybe it's split profits. Maybe it's whatever. But how do you determine pricing if you were to if someone approached you and said, "Hey, we've never done this before. We're yeah. going to do it." How do you how do you arrive at it? Yeah. So so we we really avoid split budget scenarios like we've really gotten to a place where we're like we charge for our time you know and that is what it is if they want to sell shirts we'll we'll staff that if they want it or they could sell the shirts so we that's like a separate item but basically we have everything broken down into like packages right so if we if we're doing a one press event we know okay like if it's one press and we're going to have two people there, like a printer and a front of house, we know how much we're gonna charge hourly just based on like what we're, what we're gonna pay our people to be there. Or let's say we're doing an event in Oklahoma City, I might reach out to you and say like, hey, do you have a printer who you think would be a good fit for this? Like we could pay you, know, you X amount. And a lot of times how that looks is like, we're actually giving you money that you could use for your shop and you're able to give your printer typically like double what they're probably making hourly to go to an event. It's kind of a win-win. But yeah, we have everything broken down by basically our capabilities. Like if I go to a beer festival, I'm like, we're gonna have one screen print press and one printer and print 60 shirts. I obviously can't charge them $20,000 for that, right? So it's all like, you know, based on capacity. So if it's a festival, maybe we would start by saying like, how many items do you want to give away, right? And if they're like, okay, we want to give away 200 shirts. We're like, well, how long is the event? They're like, four hours. We only, you know, we need one press there. It's going to be pretty mellow. It's like maybe two people and we work, work from there. Is if that a, good. Yeah, but th there could be a scenario where they're like, we need 200 shirts in 20 minutes during this small window of time. And we're like, cool, we could do that too. Maybe we're going to be like pre-print some shirts or, or we're going to staff the shit out of it. We're going to be like, we're going to have three presses, six people, and just do it all real quick. So, Is it a combination between hourly and then the charge for the shirts? Yes. Yeah. Sorry. We charge for the blank item, which is marked up, and hourly, and a setup fee. So, yeah, well, our setup fee covers our shipping costs, our insurance, you know, our admin time. So, and, and to be honest, we made a conscious effort to be pretty expensive because our goal is not to compete with local shops. Our goal is to like 
bring in as many as we can and then partner with local shops. And I can't partner with a local shop if we don't get paid a lot. So we're, we're on the high end of, of pricing. Insurance, you just mentioned. What's yeah. up with that? We insure every event. We have to have coverage. Um, you know, I would say like a third of the events or so do require it. And we'll get, we actually just had an event that we had to cancel yesterday because there was a medical clause of like needing some like, like $10 million of some like obscure medical coverage that we've never heard before. And we're like, okay, we, our insurance agent was just basically like, you can't get this. And so it's a no go, but we work with a lot of big, you know, corporate customers or, or inexpensive venues. So we just make sure that every event has, you know, liability coverage and workers con like everybody's covered. If you ruin somebody's uh, shirt or uh, dress because yeah. they're standing there and, and your print is it covered like that In kind of thing? In theory, it is. There's probably a deductible or something. I don't know. I insurance sucks, dude. So insurance yeah. sucks. Yes, yeah. it does. Yeah. <laughs> so other questions? Nope. We're good. Check one, two, cool. So another scenario is, uh, and it just happened to me two days ago while I was on this phone call, it's a brewery that we have a great relationship with. And uh, they asked us to come out and do that. And then I've been trying to tweak how to price it because, um, you know, when I told her, you know, it's a flat rate of this much with this many blank items and uh, for, you know, this much time, she was like, well, we kind of just want to promote you. And then you, you know, it's kind of like they're doing us a favor, you right. know, in a sense. And so at what point do you say like, no, I got to cover my ass. And at what point do you say, do you just bite the bullet and Sometime risk early it on. and sell the... So, so we say no. And I, I specifically don't work with customers because I won't say no. So... Um, and I'll say yes to all the stupid stuff and be like, oh, but this is a good opportunity or whatever. It's not. You're not going to promote it. No one gives a shit. Business-wise, so, it's just... Yeah. So luckily, my account managers are pretty good at just like buy the books. And we're not the right fit for, you know, like we... I would say out of, out of the inquiries that we get, we close a much lower percentage than we do on like someone looking for 100 T-shirts screen printed, right? Like custom screen printing orders uh, we close like i think it's like 78 percent or something of our our leads unlike live printing it's like 15 percent. so it's it's just a totally different thing you know but it, but it's not worth it you have to look at like i think you have to assume that you're going to get nothing out of it and if you get nothing out of it then it's like how much is it worth it for you to just go and and do and then if you get something out of it it's like a bonus yeah You've worked for us, right? Yeah, yeah I, I saw your name. Sweet. Where are you? Where are you? In awesome. Nice. All right. Other nice. questions? <laughs> Justin hates public sneezing, so I had to say. Um, okay. Do you typically print with Plastisol always, or will you switch it up with water base, or what's your guys's like go-to yeah. with ink? So our shop, in general doesn't discriminate against inks. Um, we kind of like, we like all the inks. They all have their place, so. And they all are terrible too. Yeah, dude, water, water-based inks have plastic in them. So <laughs> the, um, we do both. We, so we do water-based plastic and we do soy ink too. Um, we don't do water-based often because it's, it's slower. We, it's the same process though, we use, um, a catalyst, a water-based fixer catalyst, but it's definitely harder to cure fast, you know? So, and actually we have a, a lot of customers who ask us for all of like the ink specs. You know, we've, we've definitely had people ask like, hey, can we get spec sheets for everything that you're gonna have there? So, yeah, we're pretty transparent. Unless we're talking about cotton. What's the significance of that? What's that? What's the significance of them asking for that? I think people like to know. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't totally know. I think sometimes it actually has to do with, like, certain buildings maybe. I, I think a lot of people don't 
they're not aware of like what it takes to print a shirt so they're not sure if we're using like a ton of crazy chemicals a lot of people are concerned that we're going to make a, a you know big Huge mess and it's it's pretty contained too so yeah i don't totally know but i know it's it comes up a decent amount actually so all right uh other questions All right. Um, how about a hand for Justin here? Do you have to look at my name? No. So I was trying to think and talk at let's the same have, time. Let's have a hand for uh, what's it? Oh, <laughs> Rick. And thank you, Stan. Um, all right. And thanks to our sponsors that make all this possible, Los Angeles Apparel, Alpha Broder, Stahls, Reese, Hirsch, and Fairweather Johnson. Check out our YouTube channel, Ink Kitchen uh, Shop Talks, and this Shop Talk will be there eventually as well, and it'll be free. All right, thanks for coming.